and like all slavery, victims see no money for their exploitation, despite what the buyer may think. You go in, you, pay, you discuss what you want, you, you pay your money up front, they normally give that to somebody else, I guess a banker. My whole history of prostitution, I never kept any of the money, you know. It was like a contract, you know, it was my lease. Just to give him the money, and uh, I had a place to stay. The pimp will make sure that the, he manages the money if they need new clothes or new shoes or anything like that. The pimp will take care of that, but the money goes all strictly to somebody else. For both of us, you two and Dustin, yeah. um, I do a deal, 350. It would normally be four. For how long? It would normally be four. Once they come home um, or the pimp picks them up, the pimp will ask, Where's my money? and they need to turn over all the money. Usually a lot of times the pimp will tell the girl what figure she needs to come home with. If it's $200, $700, and they really can't come home until they have that money. Ever since you make it goes to somebody. There was money in the club, but you weren't seeing where it was going because they were taking it back from you, so you weren't making sense staying there. You give money to help them out or because you have to give them money? Yeah, I have to give him money. Mm -hmm. You make sure you give him the money? Yeah. <laughs> and if you didn't pay him your money, what would happen? He said he would kill me or my family in Nigeria. These are not idle threats. I brought home, I think, like $800, and he said he wanted at least five more. And as I'm walking out the door, he just goes off. He was kicking my face in, he was kicking, you know, my stomach. I was coughing up blood. I must wear for him high boots so that, that the customers couldn't see that he kicked me on my knees. If you're out of pocket, if you look at somebody else, if you give somebody else your money, if you talk to somebody that, that doesn't have money or is not about business, um, you get beat up. But the pimp is hardly the only source of danger. They want to uh, kill me to the, you know, there. Hit you against the wall? Yeah, yeah, to the wall and they want to take my money. I got kidnapped one time on all the way to California interstate and just left there. I've been robbed with a stun gun in prostitution. He dropped me off by the railroad track. I mean, it really never ends. For trafficking victims, mental, sexual, and physical abuse, economic deprivation, family rejection, and the abject scorn of society are lifelong effects. There is this lasting effect on them, the sense of having no self-value anymore. Yes, sometimes I do feel that they did, that I'm not a person, that anybody can just hurt me and walk away. And the window is worse than, I think, because, uh, yeah, you stay there with a little bit clothes on and everybody look at you and uh, I, I feel like a monkey in the window, like, uh, yeah, not like a human, but, uh, how do I say that? Uh, an animal. Yeah, animal, yeah. And the result of this dehumanization can be severe. The first time I took some drugs, a lot of drugs, and that's when they rushed me to the hospital. The second time I, I wanted to jump out of the window, I so I have to uh, enjoy myself. That's a glass because I jump out of the window, I want to kill myself. So I couldn't go out of the window, my hand gets stuck on the glass. So they rushed me to the hospital for the second time again. If my sister was to go into prostitution, I'd probably go out there and get her. There is no ends if so, but about it. Um, okay, hold on. This is what buyers are paying for. In supporting the sex market, in making traffickers rich, the buyer is causing human suffering. 
human pain, human slavery. No, it's, no, it's not the life. It's not what, um, not for, not for. It's not worth it. It's not worth it. There's, there is nothing. I don't care if I would have to die for her. I should, should, no. No. There's nothing fascinating about it. I don't. I think about it all the time, and um, I, I just don't like to think about it. I don't want to think about it. You know, I just hope she grows up and does what I didn't do and, you know, have a normal life. Without adequate prosecution, demand only increases. It's not something, you know, I thought about that much after. Anti-prostitution law only punish those who sell herself, but they don't punish the, the guy who buy the sex. We have to punish the guy who try to buy sex, not the other person. Because if I think that if she had a choice, she wouldn't do that. The men are not punished, it's just the brokers that are punished and um, the organized crime behind it. But the buyers, the men buyers, um, customers, they are not punished, which is why there is still demand and which is why human trafficking is still prevalent. Every dollar spent on the sex market encourages traffickers to recruit more victims. So the buyer, whether aware of this or not, is directly facilitating a criminal enterprise. They're not looking for a mutual relationship, they're looking for someone to exploit. She was from Venezuela, and I can't remember her name. You have to, to, to switch that button and try to forget as much as you can about the, the, the person behind the body behind the window and then you will survive and get your need met and try to get out of there without with a clear conscience. Where do we go? To your place or in the car? We go in the car. In the car? Yeah. But these buyers are not only exploiting other human beings, they are directly servicing the modern day slave trade, a market that spans the globe. The countries I've visited are Amsterdam to start off with, Czech Republic, um, Thailand, and Brazil, um, and the European ones I've been to a couple of times. Um, and this is over the last five years. You know, people talk about how awful it is that in a place like Nepal or like a place like Thailand, you know, you can have a people or a country that can allow their children to be sold. But the reality is that it's no different right here in Washington, D.C. We have Dominican Republic, we have Brazilians, we have uh, the Russians, we have the Syrians, uh, we have people coming from uh, Cuba. Like, anywhere, they can, anywhere they can get these girls to come in, there you go. So there's no boundary, there's no boundary, there's no boundary at all. You know? As trafficking spreads and new markets develop, buyers can satisfy their demand locally. Notions of sex tourism or trafficking as problems limited to the developing world are no longer valid. The men who go there are men who come from abroad specifically to see these women and to visit these women, but there are also family fathers who uh, just feel the need to, to visit a prostitute, so it can be both. And this increase in local demand leads to an increase in local victims. Women and girls who are recruited from rural areas from Oklahoma, uh, from Minnesota, from all different um, regions across the United States. It is almost impossible to determine the scope of this problem. Traffickers stay in the shadows, and victims are kept silent. 
In terms of the numbers, according to the U.S. government, the number of children who are at high risk, and these are American children who are at high risk for sex trafficking, that ranges for anywhere from 100,000 to 300,000 each year. And again, it's not including the numbers who've been abused and trafficked in the past.